Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Common View Podcast. My name is Zach Goodman. I'm going to be your host. And today we have, once again, another very special guest, uh, the one and only, Devin Bales, Chef Devin Bales, if you will. Devin, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks. Absolutely, man. I've known you for, I, I'm going to steal the line directly out of your mouth, probably the better part of a decade. Yeah, Um since uh, back in the high school days. Yeah, absolutely, dude. But um, for those who don't know you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, uh, I've been working in the culinary field for the better part of seven years. Um, I've been working in the Triangle, mainly uh, Raleigh and the North Hills area for the majority of that time. Um, I didn't go to school for it. Uh, it was just something I, I did in the meantime while I was actually going to school for simulation and game design as a major and uh, art as a minor. Um, but I worked uh, up in Wakefield Commons and the North Hills area for all that are f familiar with it. Um, started off as a dishwasher working in a, a bowling alley and actually uh, the King's Bowling Alley back when it was still Sparing's Bowling Boutique and Bistro. Um, I started as a dishwasher there, worked my way up to saute. A friend of mine got me in over at the Renaissance North Hills working with Concord and Marriott. Um, worked there for about three years. Moved over to the AC Marriott North Hills following my chef, um, where actually you worked with me <laughs> for a few years. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was fun. Um, <laughs> but uh, came up around uh, to the title of suit chef there and um, recently have left for greener pastures that I'm not quite sure what they are yet. <laughs> <laughs> that is okay, man. You have to, you know, you have to make those decisions when it's time. But yeah, so as, as a man of culinary knowledge. Mm -hmm. So many questions. <laughs> so many questions. It's a broad field. The longer you look into culinary, like when I first started out in in cooking, I started out frying chicken and wearing a chicken hat. And I do then I, that. <laughs> I, yeah. And then I went to work with you and I remember my knowledge base expanded just exponentially over the amount of time that I was there. There's so much depth to it mm -hmm. that I think a lot of people miss on the surface because we are, for those of us that work in that industry or have worked in that industry, fortunately, we're kind of in the age of the celebrity chef. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, celebrity chefs pop up left and right. I mean, and the platform isn't just Food Network anymore, you know, um, for really mainstreaming people like Bobby Flay and all that goodness. Um, YouTube you know, people who actually don't even really have a culinary background, like uh, binging with Babish, you know, he, for what I understand, has no training um, as far as cooking other than just, you know, self-indulgent training, um, you know, and then he's on shows like The Chef Show um, and getting referenced in multiple media outlets for just people talking about the culinary field. Um, so it's definitely an age where you can get very, very much notoriety, a whole lot of notoriety, um, just for even touching on the field. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's something that people are fascinated with because we're around food every day. You have to eat to survive. We have all eaten. And I, in that way, it's a, it's a universal thing. It's not like other topics where some people are into it. Some people aren't. No, everyone's into food. You, <laughs> you, if you're not into food, you don't live very long. Exactly. So I, I think it, it, has the ability to touch a large base of people. And then also, I, I, for me, the attraction is watching people take ordinary dishes, ordinary ingredients, and making something extraordinary out of them visually with the flavors they use, the techniques that they use. And I was I was reading a book one time and it was uh, it was like a daily thing of like just quotes from a bunch of famous chefs. Mm -hmm. And one day there was a, a gentleman who um, famous Italian chef can't remember the name off the top of my head. But then again, there have been a lot of famous Italian chefs. And he's like, I could spend the entire rest of my career just learning about different ways to use tomatoes. Yeah. I mean, especially uh, just for that statement alone, I mean, tomatoes are a cornerstone of umami, you know, the uh, umami. Yeah. <laughs> Keyword of the day. Um, you know, the flavor centers of your tongue are broken down into, uh, you know, different sectors. Umami being one of them. I think it's your center palate. Um, but then you also have like salty, sweet, tangy, 
all that stuff. And there are chefs who have dedicated their entire careers and lives to just perfecting, you know, one type of ingredient. There's another chef uh, who spent years and years just learning how to perfectly use the egg, you know, a very versatile ingredient, but still it's like perfectly use the egg. <laughs> so someone using the tomato or something like that is, isn't out there at all. I mean, and, and there's just, it, it is a difficult topic to to talk about just because there is such a broad um, variety of things. You know, it's, it's steeped in culture, you know, it's steeped in uh, regional areas. It's, as you said, just it, everybody eats. <laughs> everybody, Every, everybody eats. Everybody does eat. And for me, another one of the things that just boggled my mind was the difference that technique makes in flavor. Mm -hmm. Because even something down to the way you cut a side of beef changes oh, yeah. how you taste that beef. And I think one of the things that people who haven't been in that industry can kind of relate that to is sushi. Yes. And not even in the roll form, but in sashimi and nigiri, mm -hmm. which is where it's just either just a slice of fish or fish and rice. And I think that speaks volumes about the effect that technique and preparation and ingredient selection has on flavor because you, you're you not, you know, with a lot of other culinary stuff, you're working with, you know, you've got a bunch of spices, there's different ways to cook things, and that all changes it. But when you're restricted to, you only have raw fish, mm -hmm. and maybe you have rice and a touch of wasabi. Yeah, I mean, and uh, the flavor for that is all generated by the quality of your product. You know, a lot of people think that sushi is just, it's fresh fish, you yank it out of the ocean, you cut it up, and then you put it on a piece of rice, or you put it on a plate. Um, that's actually not true. What a lot of people don't know about uh, sushi is that it's actually fresh frozen, uh, flash frozen, I'm sorry, and then shipped all over the world. You know, tuna, tuna mainly comes from the shores of, of Japan. Um, they do buy some American tuna, but actually Japanese fishmongers have kind of a, 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 a fight with, with American tuna. They, they say that we kill it incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a fish, you know, how do you kill it incorrectly? But it is, it's because uh, when usually with uh, American fishermen, what happens is when we pull fish out, we gore it essentially, or, you know, stab it with a big stick to kill it. The Japanese will generally bleed it almost like a halal. Uh, which is, you know, where you bleed it and face it to the east, I believe. Um, they'll bleed the fish and then freeze it and everything. So long story short, it, it comes from that. It comes from the quality of the catch, comes from the area to really accentuate the flavors of that. And uh, it also comes down to just the, even the rice, cooking the rice correctly, where you get the grain from. A lot of it just comes from where you source your material. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I, I learned that really just can elevate the quality of any dish, even if you're just cooking at home, is choosing fresh ingredients, choosing local ingredients, choosing high quality ingredients. You can make the same dish with, you know, Tyson chicken, but <laughs> if you take the time to go get something a little higher quality, you're going to notice that difference. Oh, absolutely. Um, and a lot of... Uh a lot of restaurants and people in general are eating farm to table nowadays, you know, locally sourced stuff. Um, North Carolina is a great place for locally sourced uh, ingredients just because, you know, we're here in the Piedmont. We have a variety of flora and fauna that grow all over the place. And then people are actually starting to, uh, to till their soil and um, fertilize their fields so that we can grow exotic uh, grains and uh, vegetables as well. No, and that's awesome, especially for us, because, mm -hmm. you know, you get a bunch of new stuff to play with. Uh, and I'll trace slightly back to one of the previous comments before we move on. But as as with anybody who has any sort of fascination in the culinary field, uh, I watched Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's just a heartwarming movie. It really is. But um, I remember the the part where they were talking to the apprentice and it's like, so what do you do? It's like I washed the rice. Mm -hmm. What else do you do? I wash the rice. How long have you been washing rice? Five years. When do you get to stop washing the rice? Seven years. Yeah, dude. I it's mean, like you spend seven years <laughs> washing rice. rice. But you make damn sure that rice is washed by the end of it. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it's very good rice, but that's a just a dedication to quality thing. 
Well, you also have to remember that we're talking about a field um, or at least an area of the culinary field where, you know, if if you want to work with a certain fish, and I'm sure you know what fish I'm talking about, you have to take, I think it's like somewhere between five and eight years of practicing before you're legally allowed to serve it, the blowfish. Oh, yeah. You know, because they have that poison gland in there and it's a small fish. You know, a lot of people see them on like National Geographic or, you know, photos on the internet. They look like a big fish because they no, can it's like the up. size of your fist at it, most. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like one of those uh, horny melons. If you ever see them at the at the supermarket, they're like the orange ones. It's about that size. Just slap a fin and some eyes on it. But you know, they have to work and train to to even cut that up for years. So I mean, learning how to wash the rice to make a foundation for that is actually, you know, a part of, especially in Japanese culture, part of the, the ideology of, you know, uh, discipline. No, absolutely. And, um, I mean, it, it translates to any other sort of kitchen where it's, you know, you start out at least in a fine dining sense. And it's like, what do you do? It's like, well, you wash dishes, but mm-hmm. after that, it's like, what's your job? I prepare carrots. Yep. Like, it, Oh, that's it. Yes. No, I, prepare carrots yeah mm-hmm. and when the chef trusts that i can prepare the carrots correctly then maybe i can prepare celery oh yeah especially in a uh, traditional french kitchens you know you don't touch plating you don't even start to make the sauces you don't start to do the saute to, to grill to do anything until you learn how to do your mirepoix you know mm-hmm. you learn how to do your mise en place everything has its place um so you kind of build the the foundation of that and i think that that's actually lost a little bit um in in uh current at least american um culinary environments it it definitely you can see in older chefs but now you have younger chefs who have great ideas who have you know uh concocted these flavor palettes and combinations that you know older chefs can't even dream of cuz you know the new generation always builds off the old and becomes better but i feel like there's also a lack of the discipline and that i used to work with this uh individual back at the renaissance um and he blew me out of the water every week we have to do uh a a muse bouche which is to you know uh start the the palate to uh, amuse the the senses before you start going into your entrees and your appetizers and we had to do an amuse bouche and we had to do a daily feature um fresh product every day uh for both of those and he would blow me out of the water for what he could do versus what i could do but this kid could not take criticism and you wouldn't even be you know like crapping on his food or anything like that you know it's like this tastes like garbage or anything like that i'm talking about constructive criticism you know i would have used this you know tarragon i think was a poor choice stuff like that um and he would just lose his mind and it's crazy because he just i don't think he had the discipline and uh I think working in the kitchen also, you kind of have to be a little bit crazy. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. <laughs> you definitely have to be a little bit crazy, a little bit of a masochist, uh, a little bit of a pyromaniac. <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes that little bit of crazy is a lot of crazy. Um, and I think he actually uh, he ended up leaving after having a squabble with the chef just over something like plating, something no. ridiculous like that. I mean, when I my, – my first encounter with a – actual kitchen and an actual chef and don't get me wrong it was not fine dining by any means it was more cafeteria style Mm -hmm. but but that was my first introduction to the brigade system call outs you know having a chain of command and um i remember that that chef brokered no shit like Mm -hmm. it was yes chef yeah okay chef we chef (laughs) we chef because if not, what you got was uh, a very large woman getting uncomfortably close to your face mm-hmm. and saying in the voice of someone who smoked three packs of cigarettes a day, <laughs> help me understand. <laughs> help me understand this because I, I want to understand where you're coming from. What is your general malfunction? What is your issue? What, what is your problem that you can't do simple tasks? And it was like, you you learned the discipline. Yeah. And it serves you in later culinary endeavors because part of working in a kitchen is understanding that there is a chain of command. And that chain of command is not necessarily something that should be argued with. Don't get me wrong. There's There's times where you can go, you know, hey, chef, I noticed that if we do this, it turns out better. Would you like to see that? 
you yeah. know, that's the proper way to approach it. But if chef says, hey, I want these cooked like this, wrapped like this, stored like this, you have one response. Yes, chef. Yes, chef. Yeah. And that's that's because and to some people, it, it I guess it seems a little arcane or a little stupid because it's like, well, why can't you just talk about it? Well, because if you've ever worked in a kitchen, when things get busy, mm -hmm. you don't need, hey, let me question these decisions. You need, okay, this is how we do it. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do that now. And that's the only way to be successful. Oh, yeah. Time if, and if place. If you've never worked a busy kitchen, mm -hmm. like, it's an experience. Yeah. I mean, there's a time and place for everything um, in the middle of a rush. is is not the time to go questioning your chef or even your KM or even... Um, you know, the guy next to you, if they know what they're doing, if they know their shit, don't question them, you know, yeah. unless you, they're giving you like a, a friggin' burnt patty on a plate or whatever, don't question them because yeah. it's just going to, you know, uh, impede progress. No, and bring it up afterwards, you know, mm -hmm. Hey man, I noticed this. Oh yeah, dude. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. I mean, it's, it's any other work environment when it comes to the personal, you know, interpersonal, um, skills of their employees and of the managers, um, I actually feel that kitchen guys, kitchen staff, and ladies, um, you kind of actually have to be a little more empathetic than you would be in other work environments because, you know, manual, it's a part manual labor, it's a part mental labor, it's a part emotional labor because, you know, people, you want people that are going to put love into what they do and passion. And you have to realize that it's not kind of a fill your briefcase up and go home, you know, take the train ride home and, and decompress kind of day like a lot of these people work into the evening early hours of the morning and they've had a shit hard stressful day being going through the gauntlet being battered you know dealing with all sorts of stuff from the front of the house to the back of the house to you know maybe pro uh, problems with uh with stocking maybe you run out of something you got to figure something out you have difficult guests someone's celiac they didn't call ahead you know, all you serve is bread. <laughs> um, that's that's my favorite when you get the uh, when you get the card coming back, mm -hmm. going all right. They can't eat this, 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 and this. What oh, yeah. can they have? A salad. They can have a with sa no dressing. <laughs> a salad, no dressing. Hold the croutons. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's you know they, they go through all this stuff. Um, most places they don't get tipped out, so there's no compensation for working harder. You know, you're expected to work 110% every day. Um, and that's what I, I was trying to say there is just that when I was managing, you know, kitchen staff and, and uh, hopefully you can agree with me when I say it, but I try to be a lot more empathetic with them because I know how it can be. And I know that the backgrounds of a lot of kitchen staff, especially the older people that have been doing it for a long time and haven't made it to a managerial state are usually involved in some kind of addiction. They've had or, or fallen on a hard time. Um, something went wrong. And uh, they're doing this because that's all that they can do and all that they know how to do and all that they want to do, in a sense. So when I do manage people like that, I try to be really empathetic, not, you know, a pushover or a pussy or anything like that. But just like, hey, man, I know where you're coming from. I know what this is. You know what this is. If there's something I can do to help you, let me know. Um, my door is always open. But, you know, we got to get this shit done. Yeah. No, I mean, I know this and you know this, but speaking to someone from a position of understanding garners better results than barking orders. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's a leadership challenge anybody who faces in any field is how do you get your workers to do what you need them to do? Yeah. I mean, and uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> they say it many times in many different ways, but that's the difference between, you know, a, a manager and a leader. You know, leaders at the forefront pulling from ahead, managers at the back, you know, riding the sleigh and cracking the whip. My my main mentor, who you know very well, <laughs> Chef Anthony Zanani, um, he's a great chef. Uh, I think that he is a decent manager. I think that he his his ideals and ideology on managing staff is a bit archaic uh, because he was trained by classical, um, classically trained Italian chefs um, all throughout uh Boston. He uh, he had several sayings. One of them was, you know, it's it's easier to loosen up than tighten up as far as um, tying in with that managerial set. Um, you know, you're hard ass at the front. And then when you start to see someone, you know, falter, you kind of show the human side a bit more. I don't necessarily agree with that to such a, a finite level, just because you do have to be kind of more of a person nowadays, especially with millennials um, being one myself or at least close enough to it. 
Um, there is a lot of feels out there today. A lot of people are feeling more. <laughs> um, and that tr has been translated into the culinary field as well, where most of the time you can even see it on the internet memes. Uh, you know, when you work with someone uh, or even live with someone like a roommate or a family member or something that works in a hard ass kitchen, they kind of come off as a hard ass dude or chick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but they're still people. Um, a lot of times, uh, I think that people forget that cause you don't see them. You see the waitresses, you see the bartenders, you see the manager, they're all smiles and up front. They look like people who I sometimes think that they're actually less people than the people in the back. Cause they got this plastic grin on their face. Whereas you walk into a kitchen and ask somebody a question, they're going to tell you how they freaking feel. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's the difference. You walk into front of a house, everyone's all smiles. Hi, how can I help you oh, today? Yeah. The you two walk into the kitchen, boys. you walk into the kitchen, you know, someone flings a pot at your head and yells, what do you want? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the the whole two octave higher than their normal speaking. Hi, hello, how are you today? What can I get for you? Are you doing all right? Let me get that for you. <laughs> you want my left leg? Absolutely. How would you like that cooked? Mm -hmm. Would you like to me uh, to carve from the top or the bottom first? <laughs> no, that's a hard job as well. But oh, I, absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm not trying to throw shade at him. But, oh, uh, no doubt. But I mean, the 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 rivalry between front and back is it's real. It's real. It exists. Yeah, We're Hat better. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hatfields and McCoys, you know. But uh I know you're you're big on Asian cuisine. Mm -hmm. But all but just from your perspective, I don't want to ask a, a an, an opinion based question like, "Hey, what do you think the best food is?" Well, that's subjective. Yeah, what's your favorite thing to cook? I get that asked every day. I don't know. What what have I had today? What have I had in the last week? What mm -hmm. am I in the mood for? That's what my favorite thing to cook is. Yeah, it's like you know. Would, do you want to eat one meal for the rest of your life? No. Who, yeah, whoever says yes is lying. I've done meal prep. I don't want to eat one meal for the rest of my life. I get bored. Yeah, even if it if it's something exquisite, you know, it's you get used to it. You you start to have a higher tolerance. Yeah, if you it. have steak and lobster every single day, you're eventually going to get tired of steak and lobster and have a slightly higher mercury level in your blood. Oh yeah, heavy metal, dude. <laughs> Yeah. But um, in terms of like things that you would want to explore deeper into or master more, what genre or field of the culinary world would that be? Um, well, as you said, I, I do have uh, a heavy influence from the Asian persuasion as far as my cooking. I just – I don't know why. I just feel like the flavors are always a lot more potent. They're more sharp if I was to put it. Um I mean, and and I grew up here in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, too, and I have family that's from Louisiana. So, you know, I know uh, comfort food. You know, I know all about that, uh, the boudin and the uh, the crawfish. I know about the fried chicken, <laughs> the mashed potatoes, the uh, the mac and cheese, the collard greens. I know about all that, and I do love them. Um, they are near and dear to my heart. And being also trained by uh, an Italian chef, um, I have a lot of uh, – I've had a lot of hands in a lot of pots of, of Italian food, figuratively speaking. Um, also literally also speaking. Also literally speaking. <laughs> um, but if I wanted to learn something, I'd – traditional French because you can just – it's such a huge stepping stool into other things. And a lot of people would be like, you know, how does that translate to, uh, you know, Asian? How does that translate to Middle Eastern cooking, Mediterranean cooking? Um, everything has a core. And I feel that French cuisine has just – uh, really taken the stance as, as being the, the mecca of that. Um, so, you know, you have your mother sauces, you know, you have all of your kitchen lingo is usually based off of something that's French. Yeah. You know? The whole brigade system is yeah, based the off. whole brigade. It's based off of the, the French cooking. Um, and, uh, in fact, I think even chef coats are still based off. Of yes, very much so. Um, I mean, they've been tweaked and altered here. No one wears the little puff hats all the time anymore. But uh, oh, hello. yeah, no one's the 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 this Swedish is my chef. Puffy hit. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's still very much steeped in um in a French background, and I would like to learn that more. Um, would I like to travel to France and and study at the Cordon Bleu? Sure. Am I going to do that any time in my life? Maybe not. Most likely not. Um, but if I could get my hooks in a in a traditionally trained French chef, I mean, I would I even you know sacrifice myself as tribute to Gordon Ramsay. I'm sure a lot of people would. <laughs> Come here, donkey. What are you? A donut? You're an effing donut. <laughs> Where's the lamb sauce? 
<laughs> oh, God. I love Gordon. What are you? An idiot sandwich. <laughs> I love Gordon so much. No. Uh, yeah, go, Gordon can come and uh, yell at me any day, as long as it makes me better. <laughs> That man is... I know that he gets a weird rap from people about, like, oh, all he does is he's just angry. It's like, well, first off, yeah, that's the premise of the show. Mm -hmm. Secondarily, like, if you watch him cooking with kids, he's not angry. He's nice. He's kind because they're children. It's when he's cooking with adults who are misrepresenting themselves as someone in the culinary field. And if you watch a lot of the material, sometimes misrepresenting themselves dangerously. Oh, yes. If I've – every episode of Kitchen Nightmares I've seen, nine out of ten times, it's they're serving something that is expired mm -hmm. or undercooked or straight rotten. Yeah, or, I mean, just uh, – you know, packaged incorrectly can be dangerous, poisonous even. Um, and I th a lot of that is reality TV too. I, I do. Oh I yeah. Do I think for the better part, it's uh, it's uh, honest. Yeah. But just like any other reality television, you know, it's like they have to find the worst things and go out of the way to find those like terrible places and people. Find those terrible places and people to. Uh, to put on television you know oh yeah i think the i think the most honest you see him at is like season one of kitchen nightmares mm -hmm. is a very human middle ground before that oh, i'm gordon ramsay and i'm yeah. going to cut your legs off the yeah. stew persona comes in because he's very he's he's he has what we were talking about previously which is the mix between you know being a hard ass which you have to be mm -hmm. and also being understanding and pulling people to the side and going, look, you know, this is how we need to do things. This is simple. Just focus on that. You'll be fine. Yeah. I mean, and the thing about him that I, I tell a lot of people, because, you know, being in the field, everybody has questions about everything that has to do with food. Um, you know, just at lunch today, I stupidly wore my hat that says chef and someone gave me a yes chef from behind the counter. <laughs> Her chef. Yep. Uh but you know, my, my even my mom has asked me, you know, um, you know, why why do you why do you think he's so upset? You know, he's he's obviously mad because they're doing it wrong, but you know, he seems to be overly upset, and I think it's because he's just feeling, you know, like this is something he's dedicated his life to that he loves, and then someone is shitting on it in front of him and saying that it's okay and that's how it should be. And I think it's like you you can translate that to anybody. You've been a professional in your field for 10, 15, 20 years, and then some dude says that he's the, you know, the tits and does it completely wrong in front of you, screws up something really bad, and then just looks at you like, oh, yeah, no, this is how it should be. How would you react? I'd be mad, too. Yeah. I mean, you just lose your shit. <laughs> Absolutely. And an another thing is just he's a wealth of knowledge. And, and I will say this. The reason that man has the acclaim he has is he was knighted for his ability to cook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you kind of got He's that. He's a good <laughs> chef, and that's an understatement. Like, yeah. I mean, there's plenty of other good chefs too that he will constantly cite helped him, you know, develop his own style of cooking. But I think that he kind of stands at the at the uh, the zenith of what a celebrity chef is as far as you know clout and ability. No, absolutely. I mean. All of them are obviously masters of their field. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a show that came out a while back. Um, I think I told you to watch it. I don't know if you ever did. The Final Table? Yeah, Final yeah. Table. And yeah. the premise of it was they took a bunch of already established chefs who were good in their field mm -hmm. and pitted them against each other. Oh, yeah. And that is just like that was the essence of competition because it wasn't a bunch of people who this was their first time in the kitchen. They had no idea what was going on and mm. were making do like a lot of those cooking contests are. And it wasn't even, hey, yeah, I've been a cook for 10 years. It was, no, they're all chefs, all restaurant owners. Half of them were Michelin star yep. award winners. Two of the guys there had James Beard awards. Mm. Like they were killer yeah, I mean, it was essentially like Chef Battle Royale, you know? Absolutely. And that's that's the other thing is, like, that also shows up an interesting thing that the, the world of the culinary field is so large mm -hmm. that even if you devoted your entire life 
to doing one style of cooking and you're incredible at that, if you go up against someone else who dedicated their entire life to a different style of cooking mm-hmm. and it the ball's in their court, it doesn't matter how good you are. One of my favorite videos is watching Gordon Ramsay get bitched out by a Japanese chef. Oh, yeah. Because, <laughs> like, can Gordon out-French cook most people alive? Yeah, yeah, most likely. But, you know, he goes into the kitchen of a traditionally trained Japanese chef, and that chef's looking at him like he would look at any of us on our first day in his kitchen, just like, no, no, <laughs> no. You have done this wrong. <laughs> oh my, what? Sinderu. Muda, 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 muda. But it's it's a fascinating field, man. I mean, it's something that you can go on ad infinitum about the complexity of the culinary world. And I, one of the things I'm happy about is Raleigh's culinary scene is really. Oh, it's popping. It is going so well. One of my favorite local Raleigh chefs is uh, Scott Crawford, Mm -hmm. who does, um, he runs Crawford and Sons, and I think he just opened up a uh, a French bistro as well. I don't remember the name of it, but I've had the privilege of talking to him personally, and just the the amount that you learn from someone's demeanor Mm -hmm. in those cases. Because he was not what I expected. Like, he was very calm. Mm Mm-hmm. But yeah. he had that presence of that made it be like, all right, he's calm and I'm going to do what he tells me to do because I don't want to see him not calm. Yeah. I mean, it's the, you know, the sleeping lion mentality. You know, it's like, you know what they can do. <laughs> they, you know, they know what they can do. So you're going to you're going to shut up and do what you're told while they're nice and happy. <laughs> Please, by all means. So in addition to the culinary field, obviously, we're all more than our work or at least mm-hmm. I hope so. Otherwise, I'm going to go to. Otherwise, I'm going to go to sleep and wake up as a bottle of hot sauce. But um, you are also you're a big fitness guy. Uh, I'm a big guy that's into fitness. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've been doing uh, fitness research and working around the field uh, for a number of years. There was a time when um, things weren't so hot at home uh, when I was about 18. Um, so I went to go live with my godparents in Iowa. And while I was up there, I was getting my GED because I dropped out of high school, as you know. When I was going to college after getting my GED, I, uh, I ended up dropping out of there to go do the, the culinary work. But um, while I was up there getting it, um, I worked at a Perkins, which not a lot of people know what a Perkins is anymore. Um, what is a Perkins? <laughs> okay, so think uh, you go home to your family for Thanksgiving. That's a restaurant. That's what you get is pies and mashed potatoes and turkey uh, and green beans and sometimes a salad. That's pretty much what Perkins was. But um, it's kind of like a Denny's, but just much, much more like at home kind of comfort food. Um, so I worked there as a host, um, not in the kitchen yet. And I also worked at a place called Aspen Athletic, um, you know, in Aspen, uh, Iowa. Um, and I worked there as a front desk agent um, and was also working uh, on learning how to do personal training. And there was uh, a lot of personal trainers that we, they actually outmanned the rest of the staff, probably three to one. They're like, there's one janitor, one front desk guy in the morning, one front desk guy at night. That was usually me and about five personal trainers. And I'm talking like big dudes. Like they went to, uh, you know, they went to um, college there and played bat or football rather, you know, Hawkeyes, and uh, big football dudes, a couple of females, um, and the guy that was actually the manager there, I think he I think he started working there because he wanted to coach the Iowa Hawkeyes but ended up not, um, not getting the job. So big fitness dudes. I worked with them, studied with them for a while, um, and actually got into really, really good shape. And then uh, after I left about six months later and came home, I continued to pursue it and wanted to do the personal training thing, um, but also being kind of like a young – dumbass kind of fell off of it and found new interests like you know partying and trying to pick up chicks <laughs> as we all do um but it's always been a love of mine um being a bigger guy especially after i started to grow because i had i had a history of being bullied in school um and i always wanted to be the big guy the big tough guy and uh once i started to grow up and eventually became you know six three uh, people stopped messing with me quite so much but i was still overweight you know and 
the defining the defining decade of your life um, being you know partially when you're in your teens, uh, being overweight is kind of a, a sin almost. You know, you can still find friends, you can still get to have relationships and stuff like that. But being kind of chubby and kind of like having a little boyish face, it made you a target, no matter how big or small you are. Um, I actually had a buddy who was who was like six six. His name was Christian. Um, he was overweight. And he still got bullied. You know, it's crazy. Um, a mammoth human being like him who looks like he could just kind of pick you up and just bite your head off. Uh, still got bullied. So I always wanted to be the big, tough guy. I wanted to be the dude that was like, you know, the don't fuck with me kind of guy. Um, so I got in really good shape and it came back and ended up losing it. <laughs> but I never stopped training. And um, I actually did uh, some training with my family. Like my godmother, when I was up in Iowa, I trained her some um, trained with you a little bit, not trained you, but trained with you some. Um, cause I mean, you used to be pretty big yourself. Yeah. That's, um, I was going to say I've, I've been in the exact same situation as you, except the flip side of it. Cause I've always been tall, but I've been a skinny guy mm-hmm. and not like skinny in a, like not skinny, but thin. Yeah. If that makes sense. Like I have always, I have, I, 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 I have, <laughs> I have looked like a skeleton for a long time. And, um, I remember when I got, I, I had a little foray into trying to get into shape, but I didn't understand how to, mm. because I think one of the misconceptions is like, yeah, you just go to the gym and lift weights. It's like, that's 10% of it. Oh yeah. The rest of it's definitely eating, you know, uh, supplementation. If, if you're into that, I mean, it, and I think Arnold Schwarzenegger actually said it best is that supplements need to supplement your diet. So it's not something where you can just smash a handful of pills in your mouth and chug a bunch of protein and you're going to get buff. You have to have a well-balanced diet of carbohydrates, protein, all your macronutrients. And I think one of the one of the common misconceptions is like, you know, how you get big is you just go to gyms, you lift weights, and boom, you get buff. Yeah, no, um... I mean, that's actually the smallest part of it. I mean, putting an effort in the gym is definitely important. Form over weight, you know, that's definitely one of the biggest things that people uh, mess up on is is ego lifting is the term for it. You know, it's like you've been going to the gym for about a week, about a month, maybe you're starting to feel a little bit strong, starting to feel a little bit better. And then, you know, I think I'll slap on an extra 80 pounds to my squat and then you blow out your back or your knees or something. Or But uh, doing the proper workouts working yourself hard, but the rest and recovery portion of it is the biggest part. You know, meal, people talk about meal preps. You and I have done meal prep. It's hell. Um, cause you're eating the same thing. <laughs> like we were talking about earlier for, you know, weeks, two weeks, maybe definitely getting in your macronutrients, your micronutrients supplementing. Um, it has to be something that can, that is going to help your diet, not necessarily slapping a bunch of pills in your face and then, you know, eating a bunch of protein and then boom, you get big. Um, it has to supplement what you're eating, but, uh, supplements should be supplemental supplements should be supplemental. Yeah. yeah. No, um, I mean, cause there, there's a huge market for them. Cause when I, the first time I actually got big, mm-hmm. um, I was on that supplement train super hard. Well, that's just kind of how you are though. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's me as a person, but like now that I'm doing it again, I I've eased off a little bit because like when I was doing it, it's like, all right, so I've got my protein blend and my creatine and my branch chain aminos and my pump activator and my L alanine to make my veins pop out of my arm and my joint support vitamins and my pre-workout and my post-workout and a tub of glutamate for recovery and just on and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And like, don't get me wrong. I, I, got big but at the same time my fundamentals weren't there either and that's what put me out of commission the first time was uh i injured the kind of tendons and ligaments in between my shoulder and my pectoral muscle yeah because i way overdid chest because that was i've got one of those uh got one of those birdcage chests a little bird bath (laughs) a little bird bath so my and that's been an insecurity my entire life so once i started putting on size and mass and muscle i was like gotta go big chest gotta gotta get a big chest it's all i want and i blew my shoulders out doing it and lost all of the gains that i had i was out of the gym for years Mm -hmm. not just through recovery but because once you stop it's hard to start back again 
Yeah, I mean, um, you kind of ha- you start at ground zero, you know, and every even the insecurities of going back into a gym resurface. You know, everybody who's never walked into a gym before, never had a membership, you know, always go with a personal trainer. Um, I believe to at least show you the ropes. You don't even have to pay them. A lot of times, personal trainers will be happy to just show you how to do something right, so you don't hurt yourself, because that's their main job is to obviously get you healthy and also make sure you don't hurt your damn self. Um, but yeah, people that walk in with a, uh, no knowledge whatsoever, it can be daunting. And especially if you go to like gold's gym or, you know, like meatball meatheads United or whatever, uh, the pig iron graveyard, whatever hellish name that they have, you know, you see these guys grunting and sweating and they're just massive beast men or women throwing weight around being loud unless you're at planet fitness where you can't fart unless you know you want to set off the lung alarm alarm. (laughs) exactly it can be scary and when i actually first started getting into shape before i went to to iowa for that short period of time i worked out at home because i didn't want anybody to see me and being a chunky kid you know body image is huge you know that was like a that was like that kid that wouldn't take off my shirt in the pool because i didn't too i didn't want people to see my my moves i didn't want people to see my bird's nest (laughs) so yeah i mean gym buddies are also a, a super important part of that i think like even if it's somebody who is v- well versed or not very well versed at all, just go with a friend. Have some support. It's as much a mental game as it is a physical game. No, oh, absolutely. And also on top of that, it it's someone else to keep you motivated because there's going to be days where you're unmotivated and you don't want to go, and you mm. need that other person to be like, "Yep, tough. Come on, get yeah. in the car. Yeah. We're going." And vice versa. There's going to be days where you're jazzed about getting in the gym, and your buddy's like. Oh man, I stayed up late last night and I really don't feel it's like no, come on. Mm-hmm. We're we're going. Our legs won't work themselves. Get in the truck. <laughs> Get in the truck. But I think another thing is um because culinary and fitness tie into each other. Yeah. Super and, huge. And well, yeah, super heavy because what you eat, your diet is so much of that. Is so much of that. And the other thing I think people mess up on is the thing that I think we all mess up on the first time you ever start seeing results, which is like, I want to get huge. I want to throw all the weight around. And there's a couple problems with that. Well, there's a, there's more than a couple problems with that. First off, it's unsustainable. Yeah. You will break your body. Mm -hmm. That's why you don't see a lot of real big buff dudes past 40 Mm -hmm. because you get to a point where you either get an injury that puts you out or you're just so busted up from putting that strain on your body that, you know, you can't get up to go to the gym. Yeah. And secondarily, the amount of calories required. Oh, it's insane. To have excess muscle mass because your body, what your body's doing when you're working out is you're making your body think, oh crap, I'm in a situation where I need to adapt to be able to do these things. Mm -hmm. And it's tied deeply into survival instinct. So at the same time, you need to supplement that with a humongous amount of calories in order to, you know, achieve the growth you're looking for and to maintain that muscle mass. And your body, for Thousands of years, we've not been a species that's been used to having a surplus of calories. Mm. Back in the day, you know, we survived on a very low caloric diet because, you know, you had to go catch your food. Yeah, hunting, food, gathering. Food didn't just, you know, you didn't have Grubhub or DoorDash. Yeah, you couldn't just go to the choke and puke and order a, you know, triple quarter pounder with cheese. Yeah. Um and it was, you kind of opened a floodgate on this, so I hope you're ready. Uh, Go. <laughs> um, so a lot of things about that, you know, there's there's so many fad diets, and the the word diet in and of itself, I don't agree with because it can't be, it can't be a diet. It has to be a lifestyle. Diets are for people that want to drastically change something about their you know their physical appearance for a short amount of time. You know, like the people from The Biggest Loser back in the day when that was a thing is. You look at them after the weight loss, and it bounces right back. You know, it's almost even worse sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because the stuff that they would use on there is just like death diets. You know what I mean? Like you complete an utter deficit of everything. And then you go back to eating like a normal human being, and you just gain it all back. 
you know, you didn't learn anything on how to eat. You learned how to starve yourself in the wrong way because there's a lot of information um, on fasting nowadays. And um, as you know, I, I kind of played with fasting in the past and, and actually did lose a, a good amount of weight here and there from that just because just when you do fasting correctly – uh, you have to give yourself enough electrolytes to have energy. Otherwise, like if you just do a water fasting or something, you're going to pass out eventually. Um, there's people that have done it for, you know, 20, 30 days or something that lost a huge amount of weight, but it's, it's kind of dangerous in that aspect because you can get water poisoning for one. Um, and two, if you don't consult your doctor or something beforehand, you can have some serious underlying illnesses that will arise during that. Um, but doing fasting correctly with the electrolytes and everything can actually heal. Uh, you lose body weight at a ridiculous rate because the deficit is all that there is. It's not you have like four grains of rice. You know, you have half a piece of chicken. You have one broccoli floret to starve yourself down because you're still giving your body food. All it is is all it's doing is learning to hold on for dear life. But if you do it correctly and you do it intelligently. All you do is convert all that fat like it's it's a it's like a bank. You've been storing money. You know, you've been storing fat for years and years and years. It's time to spend it. And yeah, it sucks because you're gonna be hungry, especially the first couple of days. But studies have shown that people that get past the first three days, four days even, feel great. They feel phenomenal because what you're doing is you're turning all those nutrients, all those vitamins, all that water in your fat and just pushing it back into your body. All the bad stuff, I mean, people think that fat is bad. Yeah, I mean, to be overly fatty is bad. But you can also think of, as, of it as a great resource that you can use. Um, and that's just a part of it. <laughs> like I said, you open up the floodgates, so there's a lot of things I can say about this. Go. Uh, another thing is a lot of people are getting into the um, the body types. Like if, you ever, if you've watched – one, you know, bodybuilding.com video on YouTube, you're going to get that jacked guy that shows, hey, man, you've been doing dieting wrong. You need to figure out your, you know, physical form, your body type. Are you a mesomorph? Are, are you we, an endomorph? Are, are you, you an ectomorph? Are you an ectomorph? You know, are your hips wider than your shoulders? Is your ass coming out of your forehead? What sort of alien are you? Exactly. You know, it's, um, I think that it, it has something to do with it. But only in the very loose sense that every body is different and every body is different. I, Ooh. Yeah, I said it. I said it. Dad jokes out. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that's just generalizing someone by the way they look. Is someone who's got more of a, a rounded abdomen going to look fatter with five pounds away than someone who has the Michael Phelps, you know, Dorito chip shape? Yeah, of course. Someone who, you know, has got a rectangle body and wide shoulders, you know, are they going to carry weight better in the upper body than you know, their lower body? Yeah, of course. But I think that that's just mostly a load of hooey. Um, no, I mean, there there is – one of the things I used to tell people because I did what I do with every subject I get into, which is read an ungodly amount of material about it and memorize everything – is a lot of people would be like, all right, hey, man, you know, you you got big. How do, how do I get big? And it's like, you know, what supplement should I take? You know, should I eat uh, chicken? Uh, it's like, well, maybe yes, maybe no. But here's the thing. Here's the very first thing you need to figure out. Are you trying to gain weight or lose weight? Well, I'm trying to gain weight. Okay, what's your daily caloric expenditure? What? How many calories do you burn a day? I don't know. Well, that's the first thing you need to figure out. Because you need to figure out how many calories you burn a day. Then you need to figure out how many calories you need to intake to offset that burn and give you a surplus. Mm -hmm. Then you need to factor in what this new workout regimen is going to do to that. Then you need to figure out where are you lacking in your vitamin and mineral composition. You know, are you getting enough D3? Are you getting enough B6? You know, are you taking a multivitamin at all? Are you taking omega-3s? Yeah, are you taking Flintstone gummies? Yeah, or are you taking Flintstone gummies? Because every part – the body is a interestingly balanced machine. Yeah. And every single one of those things is detrimental to you in a surplus and also in a deficit. Yeah, absolutely. So you need to find that sweet spot, and then you need to do the thing that people hate the most. You need to keep track of it. Yeah, and work 
<laughs> yeah. Look at it. <laughs> and work at it. And same with workouts. Like, people want a, man, what's the fastest way to get big? Anabolic steroids. Okay. Yeah. Do, you, do you do you but do you mean the fastest way to get big without making your testicles the size of grapes? Yeah, dropping your sperm count to two. Yeah, you know the answer to that is get a steady workout plan. I'm a big fan of the three two split. Three days on, one day off. Two days on, one day off. Yeah. You know you also don't want to overwork your body because if you're overworking your body, it doesn't have time to heal. And muscle mass, all that is, is you tearing your fibers down and them regrowing stronger. Yeah. You don't let them regrow. You're not doing anything. You're just sore and weak. Pretty much. And on top of that, it's like, all right, so now you need to get a workout plan. What do you mean? Well, you can't just run into the gym and do whatever you feel like. That's not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. So either take a class from an instructor that knows what they're doing. Or look up one of the millions of plans that already exists and follow it and then bring a notebook with you. Yeah. Okay. And write it down. Okay. This week, my bench was this and I managed this many repetitions at this weight. Next week, we're going to do this. Week after that, we're going to do this. Track and track and track and track. Because that's the only way if you go in feeling it out, you'll get half-assed results. I mean, you'll get results. But just half-assed results. Just half-assed results. And it's, you know, there's a lot of science that goes into it. And I think the irony is, and don't get me wrong, I love the stereotype too, but that like people who are super big are just gigantic meatheads. Mm. It's just like, yeah, I go to the gym, I pump iron. It's like, no, those guys probably know more about anatomy and body chemistry and like digestive function and vitamins and minerals and protein ratios than you do. Yeah, absolutely. And like kind of what you said um, earlier is you don't find a lot of big guys over 40. Um, and a lot of the people that you do follow that regimen of keeping track, keeping an eye on what they're doing very, very closely. Um, and obviously uh, a lot of the bodybuilding people like competitive bodybuilders are in the older range now. Um, you know, Jay Cutler, I'm pretty sure he's in his 40s. Um, I don't think he's super old, but, you know, they pay very close. It's their job, but they pay very close attention to their body. They, you know, the pound for pound, um, you know, one gram of protein to, to one pound of lean body mass. You know, they do the splits. They work hard, go, you know, for six hours sometimes in the gym, something ridiculous. But then they also take like three days off, go get massages. You know, they go to saunas, uh, just relaxation time and not just R&R, &R, but stuff to actually keep their body from breaking down to rejuvenate it. Um, and I think if you don't go in there with some kind of idea of what you're doing, at least later on after you've been working out for a while and just start to feel better, then you are going to get half-assed results. Yeah, absolutely. I, and another thing that I, I kind of lost in my ramble there was um, the whole idea that lifting higher weight gives you better results and that's, I mean, yes and no. Yeah. You will get better results doing a lower weight with correct form than you will from doing a higher weight and struggling through it. Yeah, I mean, and it's, uh, you know, it's called cheating or essentially, you know, like giving a little bit of help from other muscle groups. Like if you do an isolated bicep curl with like, you know, a barbell, um, if you stand perfectly straight, Keep your chest or keep your abdomen tight and focus solely on the biceps. And it's a mind muscle connection as well. Like one of the things I hate the most, and I expressed this to you the other day, is doing back because I just I don't feel it in my back. And for many, many years, I didn't feel it in my back. I felt like I was just working, you know, my rear delts and my biceps. Um, but when I started to think, like almost envision the muscle group in my head as I was pulling and kind of make that um, muscle mind connection, I started to see results. Um, but yeah, if you if you do their correct form, if you you know keep the weights struggle worthy, you know you got to pull, you got to pull. Yeah, no. Um, you can't just be there all day, you know, just like you're flicking a yo-yo or something with your biceps. But um, you know, do slow motions, slow receding motions, especially like contracting the muscles. Just important, but I see a lot of people do this is they'll contract the muscle and then just let it go. 
you know, and then you get the big slammers, the big weight slammers who are just throwing it back on the rack or just letting the uh, pulley machines just drop the plates. Um, but it's almost more important to, as you're releasing the muscle to do it slow and to do it correct. Um, but when you're throwing up, you know, curling 55s in each hand, you're not a big guy, you know, doing dumbbells. You're doing, throwing up 55s and you see the guys, everybody's seen them, who almost like drop down a little bit in the waist and then push from their feet up and you know yeah, haul it up with their yeah haul it up with their back they're swinging the weight up there and they're feeling big and they think they look great but everybody's kind of looking at them like they're an idiot if they know what they're doing um that's not going to get you anywhere and that is again ego lifting you're going to you're going to end up hurting yourself if you do that mm-hmm. no one of the one of the things about exercise that i enjoy that seems counterintuitive is like i think a lot of people think that if you're going to go and work out like there's there's two ways to do it there's the way we've been talking about which is like you're going for focused results okay you either want to lose weight or you want to gain weight but just for general exercise just for health it's a lot more accessible yeah and also like just go do it do something because so since i started working for myself because when i worked in a kitchen you know i'm on my feet eight to 12 hours a day, Mm -hmm. you know, am I really working too, working out too much? No, but I'm walking, you know, I'm walking two or three miles in a hundred foot square over the course of a shift. Yeah. Um, and so that provides something, but when I started working from home and working for myself, well, then all I do is sit in a chair all day and occasionally get up to use the bathroom or eat something. And I felt freaking awful. Yeah. I was tired all the time. It didn't matter how much I slept. I could sleep for eight, nine hours, wake up, chug an energy drink, and be exhausted. And one of the things I found that, once again, it seems kind of counterintuitive, but if you get out and do something physical, you don't have to do it great. You don't have to be the fastest person running. You don't have to be the strongest person in the gym you don't even have to be trying to get faster or stronger. It helps, but you, you don't have to be trying that hard, but get out and do something and you'll be surprised the extra amount of energy you'd have. Yeah. Because, I'm- I mean, for me, dude, like the idea that I would wake up in the morning and go run a mile was ludicrous. First off, I hate running. I smoked in one form or another for almost the entirety of my adult life i don't like running and running doesn't like me yeah but i would get up excited to go run every morning because as soon as i'd get back to the house yeah would i be sweaty yeah would my chest sometimes hurt sure but i would have energy and i'd be awake and i'd be ready to go yeah i mean you chase the rush after a while you know and it becomes a part of your lifestyle um I mean, there's a uh, you know chemicals in the brain that get released when you exercise, you know you that sweet sweet dopamine that sweet sweet dopamine, um, but uh, it it does heighten your mood, you know, and it makes you feel better. And personally, I'm kind of a masochist, um, obviously for working in the kitchen, but uh, I I like the swell, I like the pump, and I also like the pain after. It makes me kind of feel like I've done something. No, the sort it, there's nothing worse in my opinion than coming back from a workout. And not being sore you're like what because did I you do feel wrong? like you've done nothing <laughs> yeah i mean we all want to get uh we all want to get jacked into the kratos shape yeah but uh you know it takes ripped, shredded and tan ripped shredded and tan man gotta love the uh the old guido chef there <laughs> oh yeah softballs and horseshoes bubby softballs and horseshoes it's all about kid bang bang <laughs> but no nah, dude i mean it's it's an important part what you eat is important for your physical health. It's important for your mental health. Working out is important for your physical health. It's important for your mental health. And I know it seems like a struggle to a lot of people, Mm -hmm. but it's worth it, A, and B, once you start doing it and you start feeling better, it's worth every moment of it. You know, yeah, the first week you're going to hate it. It's Mm going to suck. Push through it. Because otherwise, everything already sucks. Like, what do you have to lose? Yeah. Oh, dang. If after a week I don't start to feel a difference, I can just go back to shoveling Cheetos in my face and feeling bad all the time. 
That's always an option. It is always an option. <laughs> That's what keeps me going. I mean, it's. It, I don't understand it. I'm, I and after coming out of you know treating myself very very poorly, um, just diet wise and you know like I said partying and everything back in the day, um, you kind of learn that your greatest investment is yourself. You know, your coined Confucius say for the day. I mean, your greatest investment is yourself because you know treat yourself right. Um, you know, mentally and physically, you eat correctly, you work out, um, take time for yourself. It's going to affect all facets of your life. You hate your job. You may not hate your job so much if you don't feel like shit, you know, your relationship's not doing well in whatever area it might be doing a little bit better if you actually feel better and, you know, don't feel like a giant turd. Yeah. (laughs) It's amazing. All right, man. Well, Hey, first off, I'd very much like to thank you for coming. Absolutely. I, I absolutely appreciate it. Mr. Bales is also uh, a part of Oak City Hot Sauce Company, who is our sponsor for the podcast today. Oak City Hot Sauce Company, local Raleigh craft hot sauce, delicious flavors, not bank breaking prices. And, uh, well, this, this, uh, this recording will have gone out after we were at the 13th annual Oxford uh, Hot Sauce Festival. Um, so you guys will follow us on social media. We'll we'll see how things have gone. But uh, Mr. Bales is our executive chef woop woop. for Oak City Hot Sauce. A good man, a good cook. But um, Devin, before you go, you got anything you want to plug? Anything? Well, only thing I really have to plug right now is Oak City Hot Sauce. <laughs> yeah, shameless selling out. But yeah, man, thank you for coming on, and uh, to all of you out there, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. And until next time, be safe and have a good one.